Oh, sure. Okay. So you made the decision to become a smoke jumper, not really thinking about that main part of being a smoke jumper. Well, yeah, I, could all, to the I'd fire. Always, I always <laughs> thought if I could, if I ran into a difficult situation, I usually am able to deal with it. Yeah. But I don't know. I I, I lost a little bit of sleep over that one uh, before my first jump. Okay, that definitely well, got my attention. I'd like to hear a little bit about the training first, but then I do want to hear that first jump story. Well, we had a new man class that was pretty large. I think uh -huh. about, I think it was about sixty nine of us, and uh, of course they were from everywhere and uh, all r really good shape. But the, the one guy that I remember was Rich Cromwell. He was a cowboy okay. from the bitter from one of the families in the bitter. Uh -huh. he, ran, he ran his mile and a half, I think we had to run down the runway in his cowboy boots. Ah. And he did it. Painful. He did it. He did it. It just about killed him, but he did it. And uh, so I, I was always impressed by that kind of person that, uh, that they take these alter alternative courses to get to where they're going, but they always get there. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about training. Well, it was, uh, you know, a lot of physical training and right. then, uh, then the, on the units and I, I hated coming in backwards because it, you know, ring my bell and I just, I hated that. And then uh, yeah, a lot of safety training and then a lot of some endurance hikes, you know, with uh, Ted Nyquist, uh, geez, that killed me packing a pack up and down those hills. But, you know, it really established a pretty high standard and I was able to meet it. Yeah. And I was proud that I could. Was there, was there ever a moment where you were worried about what you had gotten yourself into? No. 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 So. I felt like I could do it. I felt like I was a pretty good bunch of people. Okay. So tell me about that first jump. Well, um, 17th man in a dug with 20 people on it. The guy in front of me threw up into his face mask, which made me want to throw up. Oh, I bet. And. Um, and when I, I was amazed by the speed of the wind going by the door, it was like, I always felt later on when I was in New York going to graduate school, whenever I was on the subway with anybody that cared to hear what I had to say, <laughs> I would explain to them that being on a subway with a tunnel rushing by was a lot like being on an airplane when you're going to jump out of it. And okay. it was more that motion, that rush going by you than the looking down into the, the picture that you're going to jump into. And that really surprised me. And then the other thing that surprised me was a puff of dust in the door uh -huh. when the guy in front of me left. It was like, well, oh, he's not here anymore. Yeah. A big puff of dust and a little bit of, quite a little bit of noise. Those were all big surprises to me. And, and of course, it was from a higher uh, altitude. I think we jumped from 2,000 feet the first time. Uh -huh. When I got to the ground, I thought, boy, my girlfriend is really going to be glad to see that I'm alive. And she came <laughs> running over and told me she had a parking ticket. Oh. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, she doesn't have her priorities right here. <laughs> or maybe she just had that much confidence in you. <laughs> yeah, apparently. But I, that's what I remember about my first jump. Had you been on an airplane before that? Uh, boy, that's a good question. I I, I think I had been on one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had been on one. Still kind of a foreign technology in oh, and yeah. of itself. And then yeah, but it, on an airplane <laughs> that, that, that you ride on as a passenger is way different. Yeah, well, you can hear all the bolts rattling in the jump plane. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, what was your first fire like well, as we a had, jumper? Yeah, we had seven jumps and then uh, first fires, uh, were. I got I got detailed to Alaska to McGrath. Oh, great. And uh, had a bunch of fires, I think three or four or five, somewhere in that range. And, and uh, that's down on the Kuskokwim River. And the um, thing I, you know, I of course was surprised by the shortness of the trees. I was ready for a tree landing in there. You can stand up and look over the top of the ones I landed on. That was kind of fun. And the, and the tundra and beating out the fire with the, with the tree. I cut a tree off and beat it off, let the permafrost take over the heat. And yeah. That stuff. That was all new. But the thing that really surprised me was we had to call for a retardant drop. And down south, they trained you to. Uh, you know, watch for the aircraft, get down on the ground, throw your tools away, watch for falling things and so forth. But um, they trade you also to get away from the fire, get out in front of it. Mm -hmm. Well, up in Alaska, that's the reverse. I got oh. out in front of it and the guy was planning to, to, to drop the retardant there. Oh, I see. Because they lead the fire, it goes move so fast. Mm -hmm. And I saw this guy coming at me, I swear to God, he was about, I'm serious, he was about Ten feet off the ground, maybe not ten feet. Oh my gosh! And just above the little treetops, and it looked like a shark coming through the tree, the hills, and then he come right at me, and I saw him grinning at me. 
<laughs> and, I, and I hit the dirt. I mean, I hit the tundra and grabbed hold of some of those trees, threw my shovels as far as I could, my shovel and my tools. And uh, when that stuff hit me, it picked me right up off the ground and dropped me back into the tundra again. And I was like a big pink booger. <laughs> you know? And I'm sure he, I'm sure he went back, and I'm sure he had a beer, and I'm sure he had a <laughs> great time telling his friends about it. But it was a big experience. I thought it was like having somebody go to land on top of you. Yeah, it's kind of like an inadvertent hazing ritual. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. that's kind of jarring that you were close enough to see the expression on his face. Oh yeah, yeah, it's like one of those mad. Uh, <laughs> uh, fighter pilots in a movie or something. Yeah, definitely. Um, so how, how long were you in Alaska? I don't remember that in that uh, that detail. Um, well, it wasn't the whole summer. Mm -hmm. And I think that summer I, we came back and I was feeling so good. Uh, how'd that work? Hmm. can't remember what I did when I had the jumps that summer. We had a couple pounder fires. Mm -hmm. but I think most of my jumps that summer were in Alaska. Okay. And then I came back ten years later. I got a, I got went off to the military, graduate school, <laughs> politics. Uh, I was speaker of the house in Montana, and again I needed some work and some money. And I came back ten years later and qualified. And so oh okay. So I did some more jumping. I went to Alaska to work to uh, Galena, and uh, then I got detailed out of there down to to Redding uh, for some of those big big pine, big trees I got down there. So did you do two seasons total, but split up by yeah, a decade? Yeah, split by 10 years. Wow, so. that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, in that first season, uh, were there any fires that were memorable, particular jumps that were memorable to you? No, I don't, not really. Um, I, I may think of something here, but I can't remember what, what, if I had any two manners down in the States. I had a, yeah, I did have one. Yeah, 67 with Jim Grask. It was a dandy. Uh, they, what they did is they had us flying up to the, to, uh, the Canadian border up on the North Idaho Panhandle, and and Jim and I were the last people in the load, and they didn't need us, so they were turning around, and coming back after they dropped a couple two manners, mm -hmm. and uh, and they some, we spotted a fire, and so we did, we got dropped on this fire, and uh, I I. Uh, I couldn't get in against the face of the the, uh, the cliff. We came we came out over the top of the mountain real close. I mean, it was real close, and then there's a huge canyon, and they spotted dropped us there. And Jim was able to stay in close to the cliff. I remember looking over and seeing him kicking out of his twists, and I had twists, and I couldn't get into the face of that canyon, and the wind took me down the side of the mountain toward Canada. I honestly thought I was going to Canada, <laughs> which I think it was Continental Mountain it was called. Oh, okay. You can see the border out there. And uh -huh. I couldn't get down. The mountain was steep. I couldn't make myself go down fast enough. Uh -huh. But I was going backwards, and the thing I hated the most about ringing my bell was landing backwards. But uh -huh. I, had, I had to go backwards to keep my uh, speed down because uh -huh. I was really moving. And when I finally hit, I got splayed all over this uh, deadfall. I mean, oh, it was very ungraceful, wow. and I think I got knocked unconscious for a brief time. But oh my gosh. when I woke up, plane was going around, and I pu pulled the radio out, and said something I don't know what, some delirious probably into the radio, and they thought I sounded good, and, and then flew away. <laughs> and then I spent uh, a couple hours trying to get up to where Jim was, and and after that it turned out to be a pretty nice fire, except for I was a little little queasy from the, getting my head head hit and. Uh, and then the walk out was a pretty long walk. I time. bet. Were you concussed? I imagine. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I just, to me, whether I get a little ring on my head or a big ring on my head, I do not like it. Yeah. That's like my vulnerable territory. But uh, anyhow, walking out was pretty memorable because the pack's so darn heavy. Uh -huh. And I remember the hard part is just getting over the deadfall. Yeah. Because the way you'll throw, when you're, I consider myself a little guy and, uh, it was tough. Yeah. It was. Yeah. I mean, people talk about 110 pounds and plus with a cargo chute or two. That's a lot of weight. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, any memorable characters in that first season of Smoke Jumping? Yeah. We had two guys. <laughs> well, one of them's gone now and now with this Woodward and Van Brock. And they were always fooling around. And, uh, They've started a few legends, but you'll have to ask them about it. You have to ask. Oh them no, them. legends are way better when they're second or third hand. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to share anything with us. <laughs> well, that, the, the word I had was they had the. Uh, of course, if you have, have a fire, most of the fires nobody ever sees. You know. Yeah. And the only way they get to see them is if you can elaborate on them when you're talking to them afterwards. But um, 
apparently these two guys got a good fire up in the in the uh, north end of the Bob Marshall, uh -huh. and they landed on the fire. This is what I'm told, and they had a. <laughs> Uh, just a snag in a snowbank, <laughs> no problem putting it out. Mm -hmm. and, he, and there was a couple of girls there, a couple of women. And so they came back after a little bit long time being up there after doing some great fishing and so forth. Uh -huh. And they had pictures of these ladies, partly clothed, wearing their jump gear. <laughs> oh, and everybody in the jump depot was just like, of all the people in the world <laughs> that had, had a good deal like that, it had to be those two yahoos. <laughs> and of course they rubbed it in. Well then, somebody was talking about it down at the Amvets, apparently in Missoula, the bar, mm -hmm. and uh, one or both of the women or their boyfriends were w were sitting at the table next door and said it all straight. Oh. Apparently, what Woodward and Van Brock had made a deal with the boyfriends so they could get the pictures <laughs> to take them back to Missoula. But I think that one even made the TV. Oh, that's funny. But anyhow, that's, that was fun. <laughs> it's nice that Missoula is such a small community that yeah. you can set those stories straight. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, tell me uh, a little bit about what you uh, you feel like that season of smoke jumping did for you. What you learned, how it maybe you know helped you develop as a person. Or <laughs> well, oh, you know, in Alaska, I was on a we were on a fire up there. The whole dug they, they unloaded the whole dug, and uh, I, I was in the last four or six guys on a fire I'm trying to find one small enough for you to do something with it, and. Uh, and I was on a fire with a friend of mine that I made up there, Art Morrison. He mm -hmm. was from Pennsylvania. And we, we laid there. Up. Art would go out and fi fish for northern pike, and I'd be looking for berries, and we are trying to get something to eat because we ate all of our food because they never came to get us. Yeah. And so one day we thought we heard a big mosquito was up on the Bering, you know, Bering Sea where the Arctic Circle is up in that country. And mm -hmm. There was nothing out there. We turned off the radio because there was no radio signal, nothing. Mm -hmm. And we thought we heard a big uh, mosquito, and it was a helicopter. So the crew boss, I can't, can't remember who it was, gets on the radio and he calls helicopter, helicopter, and we can hear you now, we can't hear you now, and all this. And pretty soon, this big old uh, twin rotor helicopter came in over the hill behind us and just boom, landed right there, you know. And we get throwing our stuff on, and he says, who are you guys? And we, <laughs> said, we said, we're the crew on fire 4D2. That I can, now you can remember the name of the fire. 4D2. <laughs> wow. 4 four Delta 2. Oh, you're the ones they've been looking for. Oh. So what had happened is somehow in wandering back and forth across the Alaskan interior, somebody put an X on a map in the wrong place. Oh, or okay. And it was a Bureau of Land Management. In fact, that's the, that's the fire where I had a malfunction in my parachute. Oh, gosh. Because we had a uh, Bureau of Land Management aircraft that had a wider door on it. Uh-huh. And I was spooked by the horizontal stabilizer. and We had a long extension on our static line, eight-foot extension on our static line. And when I jumped out, went through my risers. And uh, and when I came around and tried to get out of my twist, I had twists again, uh, my reserve parachute was was behind me between my legs and behind me when oh. I got it in front of me it was too late to I, I started to cut it loose it was too late I was really losing altitude fast so I kept one side of my reserve parachute on and it was flopping out in front of me and then I, I still had twists and just a little ball for a main parachute and, oh my uh, gosh put my hands up above my head and held on to that rope that the twists were made into uh -huh. and, and I landed with my feet up flat on my back and uh, put a I put a, a bent my hard hat, which is hard to do with my leg. It was in my rope pocket, and I was I really was quite an experience. You know, everything slowed down, and but all the training kicked in. Yeah, I did everything. You know, I ended up having shroud shroud lines under my neck, and I cleared those. Did everything right. Uh huh. Time. So that fire was quite a fire because wow. that's why they didn't put us on the map in the right place. Uh huh. 